welcome to the Penguin Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Penguin Podcast. My name is Tim Hayward and I'm the author of Food DIY, How to Make Your Own Everything. I'm here to present this episode on food. There are lots of different chefs joining me today to talk about a variety of different methods of cooking, cuisines and techniques, from one-pot wonders and Indian food to cooking on a budget and, of course, DIY cooking. To kick things off, we have an audiobook extract from Mary Berry's autobiography, Recipe for Life, which is read by Patricia Hodge. I truly believe that any success I have had in my career is down to the domestic science mistress, Miss Date. She was a small lady, and you wouldn't have noticed her in the street except for her smile, which was warm and ever-present. But a lovelier, more inspiring teacher I can't imagine. She was more like a friend than a schoolteacher, and we all adored her. Miss Bolton recalls coming to admire the new domestic science department, and while she was talking to Miss Date at the front of the room, I apparently came over to them and said, You two go on talking and don't turn round until I say so. Can you imagine me daring to say that to the likes of Miss Blackburn? Evidently, the pair of them humoured me, and when I finally gave them permission to turn around, they discovered that I'd rolled out a long, thin sausage of pastry that I had formed into the words, I love you, Miss Date. After I spoke in a recent interview about my fondness for Miss Date, or Datey, as we called her, I was deluged with letters from other former pupils keen to share their memories. One recalled that Datey, a keen gardener and nature lover, had a tame owl called Flick that used to fly in through her spare bedroom window to retrieve the bits of meat that she'd left out for it. Another remembers Miss Date bringing home a pet chameleon after a trip to Africa, and all the pupils taking turns to hold it against their jumpers to see if it would change colour. She really was a wonderful character. And so, for the first time, I found myself in the unusual position of being desperate to get to school in the morning so I could get started on our latest domestic science project. It wasn't just the process of cooking that I found so enjoyable. It was seeing other people's appreciation of the end product. And to this day, one of the main reasons I love cooking is the oohs and ahs that a wonderful plate of food can inspire. To be able to put a smile on a loved one's face with something you've created from scratch is incredibly rewarding, especially for someone like me, who had been a total disappointment in all other areas of my schooling. One day, I brought home a treacle sponge pudding I'd made, excited and a little nervous at the prospect of serving it at supper that evening. While my parents and brothers waited around the table, I reheated the sponge, turned it out of the bowl and poured the golden syrup over the top, so it oozed down the sides as I brought it to the table. I remember watching Dad out of the corner of my eye as he took a bite, anxious to see his reaction. To my delight, his eyes lit up. Gosh, this is good, he said. Just as good as Mum's. Well, as you can imagine, I was bursting with pride. My brothers were equally enthusiastic, and I was left with a real sense of achievement, a feeling that I had managed to do something well. Not only that, but my father started to take an interest in what I was doing at school. Most people love the comfort of a nursery-style pudding, especially in winter. This one is always popular, even with people who would not normally eat puddings. To vary it, I often add two chopped dessert apples to the syrup. Serves four to six. Five generous tablespoons golden syrup. 100 grams, four ounces, soft butter. 100 grams, four ounces, caster sugar. 100 grams, four ounces, self-raising flour. One level teaspoon baking powder, two large eggs, two tablespoons milk. Generously butter a one litre, two pint pudding basin and cut a square of foil to fit neatly into the base. Spoon the golden syrup into the base of the basin onto the foil square. Measure the remaining ingredients into a bowl and whisk with an electric hand whisk until blended. 
Spoon the mixture into the prepared basin on top of the syrup and smooth the surface. There will be extra space above the mixture if you use a two-pint basin. Cut generous squares of both greaseproof paper and foil, large enough to overhang the top of the basin, and fold a pleat in the centre. This allows for the sponge to rise. Lay the paper first and then the foil on top and tightly twist around the edges to seal or tie with a piece of string. Sit a pastry cutter in the base of a steamer or large saucepan and lower the basin and sit it on top of the cutter. This protects the base of the sponge from overcooking. Pour simmering water up to halfway around the basin. Cover with a lid and steam over a low heat for about one and a half hours. Keep checking if the water needs topping up. Remove the paper and foil and turn the pudding out. Then remove the base square of foil if it's attached to the syrupy sponge. Serve hot with custard and cream. If you can find an excuse, serve with extra warmed golden syrup too. Just heat some in a pan. That was Patricia Hodge reading Mary Berry's autobiography, Recipe for Life, which is out now. Last month, Penguin hosted a food evening for their cookery authors, which gave the podcast team a chance to catch up with a few of the authors who are publishing books next year. They wanted to find out about their role models, their quick cheats, last-minute dinner plans, and other culinary tips. Up first are the Chiappa sisters and Helena Attlee. Hello, I'm Anna. I'm here with the Chiappa sisters and Helena Attlee. And my first question for you is, what is your favourite ingredient to cook with? Oh, I didn't think that was going to be the first one, so I'm going to pass it over to Romina while I have a think. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, okay, well, I'm going to go with our classic, which is olive oil. Oh, I was just going to say that. <laughs> uh, purely because it tends to go in all our recipes, classic. Or we've, I, we, all got, we all got shipped off to university with a bottle of olive oil that just tends to be put into any recipe. And I used to come home from school and have olive oil and balsamic vinegar dipped in with bread and pretty much, so long as that's in my kitchen, I'm pretty happy. So I was going to say olive oil as well, um, but um, I would, I'll probably say Parmesan cheese because um, for, we use it a lot as a natural flavouring, so you don't have to use a lot of salt. Um, we keep it in our freezer, ready grated, because you can just grab it in the handful as frozen, it doesn't freeze as a block, so yeah, probably... Snap, cheese. but parmesan cheese as well. Well, I'm going to have to say citrus because I've written a book about citrus fruit in Italy. And in the process of researching it, I found some wonderful recipes for all sorts of citrus fruit, many of them that we don't even know about in Britain. Little things like quinotti and um, what else? Bergamot. Didn't know that you could cook with bergamot. Citrons. So that's really been my interest, how to use citrus in cooking. And my second question is, who was it who taught you how to cook? Well, I probably can answer for the two of us. Um, we've got a third sister who's missing and it will apply for her too. But um, we learned to cook from our mum and our nonna, which is our grandmother. And that's, um, we're not professional chefs, but that's where our learning came from. We're just, the minute you can walk and talk in our family, you're in the kitchen and you're involved in some capacity. Great, thank you. So I'm here with Lindsay Barham and Felicity Cloak. And my first question for the two of you is, what are your best cheats in the kitchen? Um, mine is probably cans of easy fried onions. It sounds pretty disgusting, but actually they're Spanish onions chopped and then fried to melting stage. And um, so it brings you sort of fif uh, about 15, 20 minutes ahead in any recipe where you need fried onions. I mean, I wouldn't use them all the time, but they're a really good standby. And the other thing is pouches of um, lentils, ready-cooked lentils. I use those a lot in salads. I definitely agree about the lentils. I'm also a bit of a fan of those little pouches of brown rice that you get sort of ready steamed, which it doesn't take that long to cook brown rice, but to cook it well, it's a bit of a faff. So they're really good to have on standby. And also I think frozen pastry or frozen berries always in my freezer because it's, you know, it's good quality. And in a fix, you can knock up something in you know, 30 minutes as opposed to an hour and a half. 
frozen peas, actually. Oh, yeah, um, frozen peas, beans. <laughs> We are the cheats. So versatile. Yeah. Soups, purees, <laughs> everything. We've got a lot of cheats there. <laughs> and I'd also like to ask who inspired you to start cooking. So I'll ask you Felicity first. Um, although my mum did cook a lot, my mum and my dad both cook a lot growing up, I would probably say the person that really inspired me to start cooking was Nigel Slater, who I completely worshipped at university when I discovered um, his book, Real Cooking. And it was, you know, someone talking about food in a really passionate, exciting way, as opposed to my mum's good housekeeping cookery book. Um, and yeah, I just, he made cooking seem quite cool and quite, dare I say it, sexy. Um, so yeah, no, <laughs> I, I lost my cooking heart to Nigel. Um, for me, um, I think it's learning on the job myself. When I went to France for the first time when I was about 12, it was just such an eye-opener to see the way that food is treated, you know, the vegetables and everything laid out in the most beautiful way. It just made me want to start cooking. And I can remember we were camping and I went to the camp shop where you used to have to go and get ice for our frozen to put in our freezer because my mother always brought bacon and butter with her you know <laughs> um, and um, I can remember seeing stuffed tomatoes and thinking it was the most exotic thing in the world and uh, it made me want to learn to cook and quite soon after that well a few years on um, I became a restaurant critic by quite by accident and started to learn to cook and that kind of got me going. Fantastic. And finally, I'm joined by Jack Monroe and Mira Soda. And I would like to ask you guys first, if you were to realise that someone was coming over for dinner in 10 minutes' time and you've completely forgotten, uh, what would you cook for them? So let's start with Mira. Hi. Um, I would cook um, a quick fish curry. So I think people think that Indian food is uh, takes a long time to cook, and actually that's not true at all, especially if you're cooking fish. So um, there's a really nice South Indian fish curry which uses coconut milk, which is just a store covered ingredient. So I'd probably dash to the supermarket, pick up an onion and some garlic and a couple of fillets of fish and um, sort of fry up the onions and the garlic quickly, uh, chuck in the fish, a few tomatoes, whack in um, the coconut milk, and that's it. You've got yourself a curry. Um, mine would be pasta alla Genovese, because I've always got a tin of potatoes in the cupboard. I've always got green beans in the freezer and herbs on the windowsill, so you can just chuck them all together in a pot with a handful of pasta, and voila, there's dinner before they've even made it through the door. So that's my fail-safe, oh no, I've forgotten what to cook meal. <laughs> and my second question for the two of you is, what is the cooking utensil that you couldn't do without? Um, so. On my 30th birthday, my mum gave me her wooden spoon, which she'd been cooking for for about 38 years. And um, it's it's just a normal wooden spoon, uh, but apart from um, there's a whole chunk of it missing where it's just sort of worn, worn down just because she's been stirring pots for 30 odd years with it. Um, and it's my favorite item ever, and definitely my favorite item to use in the kitchen. Um, mine would be my grater because you can replace a masher with a fork and a spoon with another spoon but if you don't have a grater you find yourself finely chopping things into oblivion so mine would definitely be, it's only a handheld really fine grater but it would be that grater. That was some interviews from the Penguin Food Evening. What's my favourite ingredient to cook with? I guess it's pork. You can cook it so many ways and I'd never get tired of pig. Who taught me to cook? probably everyone else I've ever cooked with. Friends, family, chefs, they all influence. And my favourite kitchen cheat? Try wrapping a cauliflower in cling film and microwaving it for three minutes. You'll never go back to the old way. For more details on the authors interviewed, go to the Penguin Podcast blog, www.thepenguinpodcast.co.uk. We have Rachel Koo giving us a little insight into her new book, Little French Kitchen. So my favourite recipe in my new cookbook, My Little French Kitchen, well, I have a few. So one of them is the cuinettes, which are buttery pastries from Brittany. They're actually cuinamum um, is the real name, but I've done many versions. Now, if you think croissant pastry is buttery, this is even more buttery. So it's crispy and caramelised on the outside and then you've got this flaky buttery pastry in the inside and a few tart red currants as well. It's very Moorish. Um, also love, well actually there are quite a few things I love. I love the sticky cassis uh, pork ribs 
with mint and broad bean couscous. It's not what you think of French food, but it's using French ingredients like the cassis, which is a blackcurrant liquor, and um, lemons to make a lovely sticky marinade. And then a, just a fresh, simple broad bean and mint couscous to go with it. A dish that reminds me of my childhood is um, probably apple strudel. My grandma in Austria, she made her own strudel dough and I used to watch her when I was a child. She'd stretch it out and then fill it with all these lovely apples and raisins and a bit of cinnamon. And um, just the smell of it baking in the oven and then tucking into it while it was still warm, just delicious. Now, when it comes to French pastries, um, I think uh, it's difficult to say I have a favourite, but one of them has to be the Paris-Brest, which is choux pastry ring covered with uh, crunchy almonds and then filled with a praline pastry cream. And actually, that inspired me in my new cookbook to make a savoury version, which is so choux pastry, but filled with a mustard mousse, slices of brie, spinach and apples. It's quite fresh, but you've got that creamy cheese and that little kick from the mustard mousse. My favourite dish when I need a speedy meal is using fresh vegetables, which I toss in some olive oil, roasting them. Um, and then I make a simple mustard and lemon vinaigrette, toss it all together and just crumble some nice cheese on top. Oh, and my favourite cheese, living in Paris and going around France, you discover a lot of cheeses, there's so many, but my ultimate cheese is an 18 month uh, Comte. It's kind of um, very salty, flavoursome and I could literally eat a whole hunk of it. One cupboard staple I couldn't live without would be chilli sauce. I like my food spicy. Um, you wouldn't think so with all my French recipes but um, when I'm not cooking French I definitely like some chilli sauce on my food. I even put it on my cheese on toast. One food I actually don't like, um, there are not many foods I don't like, I'm, I'm always open to trying new things, but um, I had this dish when I was visiting Bordeaux and the restaurant I visited said, oh, what would you like? And I said, bring me your speciality. So the lady, she brought me um, these snails, which were in choux pastry with some foie gras and a red wine sauce. I mean, it looked beautiful. Um, and then I bite into the shoe pastry with the snail and it's gritty. So they hadn't cleaned the snails properly. So it was sandy and it was a bit crunchy. And Well, basically, it wasn't very nice. So I'm not a big fan of gritty snails. I wish I had the chance to cook more... Hmm. I say, I say more seafood... Because even though Paris, you have great fishmongers and London, you have great fishmongers. If you live by the sea and you have access to fish and seafood, which just comes straight out the sea, it's so different. When I was in Marseille researching the book, literally, you go to the old port and the fishermen would come in on their boats. They just tip out onto a table, whatever they caught. And it was so fresh. The fish were just flipping about. So um, when it's as fresh as that... It's amazing. No kitchen should be without a good chef knife. Um, it has to be sharp. If you work with a blunt knife, you've probably heard it loads of times before. It's just, um, it drives me up the wall. It, you know, you can't work properly without a good chef's knife. If I could cook a meal for anyone, um, it would have to be my Austrian grandma. So... My grandma in Austria, she cooked a lot. I grew up, you know, spending time in her kitchen. And unfortunately, she passed away before um, I could actually, you know, before I changed careers, before I got into food and, you know, started writing cookbooks. So I'd love to cook her some of the dishes, you know, I've written in my new book. My biggest culinary influences have to be my parents, I think. Um, the fact my mum's from Austria, I have a lot of, you know, influence from the dishes there, but also my dad being from Malaysia, you know, the Malaysian culture, the Chinese culture, it's a bit of a melting pot. Um, and also living, you know, in the UK and France, I think you absorb 
the culture and the food which you are surrounded by. So, um, yeah, I think it's it's a melting pot of many different things. My top tip for a budding chef is um, get as much work experience and practice as you can. Um, if you want to go into uh, chefing and, um, you know, you're either changing career or you're thinking about it, even before you commit to going to culinary school and investing that money and time, just spend a week or two weeks working in the best local restaurant you have, um, most likely for free, to see whether you actually like it because it's really hard work. It's back-breaking, but you might like that rush when you have the service. You know, it might give you a buzz um, and love cooking with food. So try it out first, you know, before you invest the money into culinary school. The next project I'm working on is actually my next book and uh, a new TV show. So I'm always on the go. There's lots of exciting projects happening and you can keep um, keep up with all my new exciting happenings on like Instagram and Twitter. Um, so it's my profiles are Cooks, R-K-H-O-O-K-S on Twitter or Rachel Cooks, K-H-O-O-K-S on Instagram. So check out what I'm doing on the social media and you'll, you'll be up to speed. And when I'm not working, I really like to curl up on the sofa with a good book. Um, it's such a luxury just to take some time and enjoy reading. And yeah, and also I love to socialise, uh, you know, meet up with friends. But having some time to read a good book, I enjoy that. That was Rachel Koo giving us a little insight into her new book, Little French Kitchen, which is out now. There's been a lot around indulgent treats in this podcast so far, but now on to a more serious topic about the dangers of sugar. David Gillespie is the author of Sweet Poison, which explains why sugar is making us fat and the long-term problems facing us by consuming too much. In this interview, he talks with Anna Mrowiak, editorial assistant at Michael Joseph, who's been trialling David's theory by going sugar-free for the last month. Here's David Gillespie giving us the main reason for giving up sugar. The real reason we should stop eating sugar is because it's progressively destroying most of our vital organs. And that sounds a bit extreme, but I'll say what I mean. It means that, first of all, sugar takes out our, our liver with a disease called fatty liver disease. Then it takes out our pancreas with a disease called type 2 diabetes. Then it takes out our kidneys with um, a disease called chronic uh, kidney disease. None of those things are good. Now, all of them uh, cause lifelong suffering to an increasingly larger and larger percentage of the population. The good news is you can not only stop it happening, you can reverse all the damage you've done just by removing sugar from your diet, changing nothing else about your diet, just removing the sugar. And the beautiful thing about that is you also lose weight. So what tips do you have for anyone who wants to embark upon giving up sugar? Okay, well, I guess the, the first thing to, to realise is that you're dealing with an addictive substance. And that means you can't just give it up like you might give up broccoli. It's much more like giving up smoking. And people who have quit smoking and quit sugar tell me that the process is identical. That is that there is a two to four week period of withdrawal where you have all of those addiction symptoms, those withdrawal symptoms. So things like headaches, mood swings, and constant cravings. Now, when you're smoking, it's a bit easy because all you've got to do is remember not to put a cigarette in your mouth. With sugar, it's a little bit more difficult because it's been embedded in every single thing on the supermarket shelves, which makes it very, very difficult to avoid. It would be like trying to give up smoking, but they put nicotine in all the food. So the first trick is making sure that you're not consuming it, which means analysing everything you've got in your cupboard, removing everything that's got more than three grams per 100 grams. So look at the back of the pack, look at the nutrition information panel, and you'll see there that it's got sugars in the list and it'll have a per 100 gram column. Ignore the per serve column. The manufacturers just make that up for their own purposes. Um, go straight to the 100 gram column. If you see a number greater than three in that per 100 gram column, then that food has to go in the bin. And once you've cleared out your house, then you're in a sugar safe environment and you can start to refill those cupboards, which are now probably mostly empty, uh, with foods that have 
uh, compliance with that rule that are less than three grams per hundred. And then all you've got to do is get through withdrawal. So what sort of foods commonly um, hide sugar in them? Which ones are notoriously bad for having hidden sugar? Well, I mean, there's a lot of foods that contain sugar that are obviously contain sugar. I'm not talking about, um, you know, soft drinks and, and chocolate bars. Everyone knows that they're full of sugar and, and knows that you should avoid them. Uh, what I'm talking about are the foods that people eat where they're told they're absolutely healthy and that they're a good alternative to chocolate bars and soft drinks. So cereal bars, um, juices. In fact, a child eating a cereal bar and a juice for morning tea is probably getting more sugar than if they were having a Mars bar and a Coke. And that's a problem because they think they're doing the right thing and they're doing exactly the wrong thing. One of the other biggest categories of sugar consumption for most people in Britain today is breakfast cereals. So most people have a cereal for breakfast. Most breakfast cereals are at least a quarter to a third sugar. That means that in the average bowl of of breakfast cereal, you're effectively adding 10 teaspoons of sugar. Now, no one would sit down with a bowl of cornflakes and add 10 teaspoons of sugar to it. Well, very few people would. Um, But that's what they do when they take a a so-called healthy muesli or or cereal out of the box and and pour that into their bowl. So that's a big one. The other one is condiments. Uh, Really catches people by surprise that barbecue sauce, for example, is more than half sugar. It's the primary ingredient, in fact, in barbecue sauce. Uh, It should be called sugar sauce. And the barbecue sauce actually has more sugar in it than chocolate sauce. Now, nobody would be adding chocolate sauce to everything they ate, but plenty of people add barbecue sauce to their their bacon and egg roll or to their sausages or, or, or whatever. Sauce gets added to a lot of stuff, and that is the equivalent of putting two, three, four teaspoons of sugar on that otherwise savoury meal. So since giving up sugar, how have you found your life's changed? Do you feel radically different? Yeah. Um, well, for starters, I'm six stone lighter, um, and, and that's pretty radically different. Uh, but it's not the most important difference. If you'd asked me at the time, is it the most important thing, it would have been the only thing that mattered, and it was what motivated me to do it in the first place. But once you get through it, once you break the addiction to sugar, it's not what you worry about. Yes, you lose weight. Yes, you're happy about that. But you're much, much happier about the fact that you suddenly feel like a cloud has lifted, like you're not thinking underwater all the time, that you you're have incredible clarity and evenness of moods. A lot of people report that. That's one of the first things they notice is their moods even out. And they have feel like they haven't been thinking straight most of their life. Um, but there's much, much better benefits than that. If you are suffering from type 2 diabetes or insulin resistance, which is the precursor to it, and you are on medication, then taking the sugar out starts to reverse that process. Many, many people have written to me and told me how their doctors have been absolutely astounded at the fact that they've had to reduce and then even take them off medications for for things like insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes. Same thing goes for hypertension. Um, Women report who are suffering from PCOS, which is polycystic ovary syndrome, report that their symptoms disappear. Um, People report that their blood tests come back so much better. After years and years and years of of eating low fat, they find suddenly that their cholesterol and their blood lipids and so on that had been all going in the wrong direction, even though they were doing exactly what they were told to do, suddenly start going in the right direction and all they did was stop eating sugar. So has your family adopted this um, sugar-free lifestyle as well, and uh, how, how have they responded to that? They have. So uh, my wife and, and our six kids uh, now are all completely sugar-free. They weren't at all initially at first. Uh, what prompted me to start looking at this was, was my wife, uh, Lizzie, having our twin, our last children, numbers five and six, uh, and she had to breastfeed them for a year. Uh, so... She uh, wasn't too interested in what I was doing, but that was the year that I was doing this. Uh, And I was just really eating whatever I wanted to eat, and she couldn't have cared less what I was eating. But at the end of that year, she noticed that I'd lost a lot of weight, and she was quite interested in how I'd managed that. And so when we got down to it, and I showed her the research and showed her why I'd done it, and then what what I'd found out about the diseases that were associated with this, not just the weight, um, she said, well why on earth aren't all of us doing it? You know, why aren't the whole family doing it? And she immediately declared that the family would be doing it. And from then on, 
um, the children have been sugar free. Now, don't expect to be elected parent of the year when you decide that your children are not going to eat sugar again in their lives. Um, it's just not, they're not going to be throwing a party in your honour. Um, but they get over it. They really do. Their palate adjusts just like an adult's palate adjusts. Um, and they learn to taste all the flavours in the world, not just 90% sweet. And they get used to it and in, indeed now enjoy it. Uh, so it's something that kids, if they're informed and if they know why they're doing it, really do get on board really quite quickly. That was David Gillespie talking about his new book, Sweet Poison Quit Plan. And you can check out more on the Well Penguin Facebook page, www.facebook.com slash wellpenguin. We're going to end this episode with a beer tasting session. The Dark Star Brewing Company have created two beers for the release of Malcolm Gladwell's latest book, David and Goliath. So there are three of us gathered here in the Penguin Podcast room to do a very special beer tasting. Uh, we collaborated with the Dark Star Brewing Company to create a limited edition Malcolm Gladwell beer. And today we're going to try it. So it's me, Kale, in the studio. And then it's Natalie. Hello. And Charlie. Hello. So let's give it a try, shall we? Let's start with the David beer. So the idea for this beer came from uh, Malcolm Gladwell's new book, David and Goliath, Underdogs, Misfits, and the Art of Battling Giants. And what Gladwell's thesis is in the book is that underdogs succeed so much more than we expect because we fundamentally misunderstand advantage and disadvantage. So with the David beer, we really wanted to portray sort of how powerful and dark and strong underdogs can be. And so we went for a really sort of dark stout at 10.5%. Um, so it's something that knocks you off unexpectedly. And it's, it's very much like David's. I mean, just the smell of it knocks you, knocks you sideways. Wow. Oh, good grief. It's like chocolate. <laughs> I mean, it is really nice. It's not a session beer, but it's something you might pick up and have like towards the end of a drinking session. You mean like a fine fortified wine yes. of a beer? Yes, it's, exactly. it's the port, it's the uh, after dinner treat. Yeah. It is like a dessert. It's kind of syrupy, rich, mm. delicious actually. Just one more sip. Yeah, yeah. I might And have if a you look at the color, it's, it's so dark. Mm -hmm. And I think that's beautiful because it sort of portrays um, underdogs as well because their pasts are often very dark and they've gone through sort of terrible life events. So we could say this beer is kind of like a symbol of triumph. Exactly. Exactly. And in the book, there are so many inspirational stories uh, of, say, dyslexic entrepreneurs yeah. who have made it despite all these difficulties and have become these huge Goliaths. Okay, we're we moving on now to Goliath. Thanks, Charlie. There you go, Nat. This is very frothy. So with Goliath, we went for a much more fruity, accessible, light beer. So this is only 6.5%, which is much less than David. And it's a very accessible beer. So we wrote on the label, we said, everyone can take on a Goliath. So here's the challenge, Charlie and Natalie, okay. take on the Goliath. Much more of a session session beer. You could drink this all night. Exactly. Is this a pale yeah. ale? It seems like it's a pale ale, IPA. Mm. Lovely golden colour and, yeah, very drinkable. You could you could start the night with this and finish it as well. It's very mainstream. But that's what Goliaths are, really. They're in the mainstream. They're what we accept to be sort of the norm. Um, so whether it's, you know, Apple computers mm -hmm. or the society at large, it's that mainstream thinking. There's something interesting in, in whether you are David or Goliath. Definitely. So which one are you? Well, I mean, no one wants to admit that they're a Goliath. And I, I generally like pale ales, but I've had my head turned. I just think that David is delicious. And as I said, in small doses, because it's potent and quite rich, yeah, it's really yummy. So I would like to nominate myself as a David. Wow, well, Natalie, you're the anarchist in the room. Oh, you're you the Martin it? Luther King. Um, and I'm going to have to say Goliath because I like this kind of session beer. Although I would always consider a David towards the end of the night. <laughs> so come on, Kelly, what about you? Yeah, I have to agree with you, Charlie. It's it's the Goliath all the way. But I think this shows how we're just so sort of constrained by society and what, what exists in society. And because everyone's always taking pale ale, we, we sort of accept it and we, we take it for granted. And that's what Goliaths are. 
but I think it's interesting how everyone said that they would still give a chance to David as well. So that that sort of shows how David's always have a chance at winning Goliath at the end of the day. And that's it from the Penguin Podcast. Don't forget to head to the Penguin Book SoundCloud page for other author readings and audiobook extracts, including my interview on food DIY at www.soundcloud.com slash penguin books. To find out more about the authors and books featured in this episode, visit the website, thepenguinpodcast.co.uk. And if you have any comments or suggestions, you can email them to podcast at uk.penguingroup.com or find them on Twitter at Penguin Podcast. You've been listening to The Penguin Podcast.